During this session, we're going to examine one of the richest treasure troves of dinosaur prints in the entire world. They happen to be found at a place called the Paluxy River in Texas, where on a nice summer day I'm standing in the middle of the river in order to explore these. Now what do dinosaur tracks or fossils have to do with creation and a biblical worldview? As it turns out, dinosaurs are one of the best tests for which view of reality and history is actually correct. You see, the evolutionary naturalistic worldview says there has not been a dinosaur walking upon the earth for the last 60 million years, and yet mankind has not appeared until about a million years or less he started to turn fully human. Meanwhile, a clear biblical worldview states that all of the animal kinds thousands of different very distinct groupings of animals, including dinosaurs, were created at the same time as mankind during that first week of creation. So dinosaurs did live at the same time as mankind. Now that's what we're going to look at in this session, the evidence that supports or rejects one or the other of these viewpoints. People often say, well, you know, dinosaurs aren't mentioned in the Bible. Uh, you would think something as grandiose as a dinosaur, God surely would have mentioned that. Now there are at least two very faulty logical assumptions made when people make these sort of statements. First of all, there are literally tens of thousands of animals that aren't mentioned in the Bible. God doesn't talk about platypus in the Bible, and yet they exist. The fact he doesn't mention them means that he didn't make them? Obviously not. And the second assumption is that because the very word dinosaur appears nowhere in the Bible or in the ancient Hebrew, they must not have been around when mankind was around. But you have to understand the very word dinosaur never existed until 1841. Even the King James Bible was written, you know, in the 1600s, long before the word dinosaur had ever come into existence. Sir Richard Owen, who was a paleontologist uh, in the 1800s, uh, digging around in the rocks, he started to find these very large bones. They obviously weren't people, they were some other sort of animal. Didn't fit any known animal that was alive at that time. He coined the term dinosaur to explain this new kind of creature that he had discovered in the rock layer. In reality, it wasn't a new creature, it was simply a creature that had been buried during Noah's flood in these rock layers. However, the Bible does mention dinosaurs in a very different way with a different word. Let me read exactly where we find the mention of these kind of creatures. And it is in what's considered one of the oldest books of the Bible, the book of Job. If you go to Job chapter 40, after God has shown and explained to Job the majesty of his creation, he specifically mentioned many, many creatures that he has created. He kind of comes to the climax to talk about the most majestic, the most magnificent, the largest creature he has made. And in the King James Bible, it calls this the behemoth, the behemoth. Now remember, the word dinosaur hadn't been invented yet. Now what is the behemoth? Let's see what it says as it describes this creature to Job. Job chapter 40 verse 15 says, Behold now the behemoth which I made along with thee. So this is a creature made along with mankind that Job has seen. This is a creature that eats grass like an ox. And lo, his strength that is in his loins, the force is in the navel of his belly. His middle section is very, very strong and large. He moves his tail like a cedar tree. He's describing a tr creature with an enormous tail, like a 30, 40 foot tall tree, two, three, four foot in diameter. That's the comparison of the tail on this creature. His bones are as strong as pieces of brass, as strong as bars of iron. He is the chief in the way of God. He lies under the shade of trees that they cover his shadow. The willows of his brook are about him. He drinks up the river and it hastens him not away. He can draw up the Jordan in his mouth. So here's a creature, towers above Job, it is a herbivore, eats grass, uh, lives amongst the reeds of a river, drinks up the river, it's so large. Now, if you look in a typical Bible notes, it will say, well, perhaps this is a hippopotamus. Does a hippopotamus have a tail like an enormous cedar tree? Obviously not. 
or they'll say maybe it's describing an elephant. Does an elephant have a tail like a cedar tree? It is absurd to believe so. You see, whenever you read those sort of things in your Bible notes, you immediately have a clue that those reading and interpreting God's Word aren't willing to accept what it actually says. Now compare that description with what we know from the bones and fossils of what an apatosaurus type dinosaur would have looked like. It fits perfectly. You see, the Bible does talk about dinosaurs. They simply weren't called dinosaurs. Now that's land dinosaurs, but what about sea-dwelling dinosaurs? Surely the Bible doesn't mention those. Well, the Bible doesn't leave that out either. You go on to Job chapter 41, it describes a creature and it says, Canst thou draw the Leviathan out with a hook? It's something that lives in water. Can you put a hook through his nose? It's obviously a rhetorical question, meaning no, this is too big, too vicious of a creature. It says, Can you fill his skin with barbs of iron or put fish spears in his head? No one is fierce enough to stir him up. His scales are his pride shut together as a closed seal. They are so near to one another that even air cannot come between them. And out of his mouth goes burning lamps and sparks of fire. The sword of him that lay at him cannot hold him, nor the spear or the dart. He maketh the deep boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. So this is a large sea creature covered with very tough armor that is one of the fiercest things mankind has seen. So this description is, is quite accurate for a very large creature that may have been in reality the representation of the type of creatures that were living at the same time as the dinosaur uh, and also at the same time of Job. The third kind of dinosaur you often hear about in dinosaur books, uh, the kind of reptiles that are the huge creatures we don't find around anymore today, are, are the flying reptiles. Some of them had wingspans that were 30 feet long from tip to tip. Does the Bible talk about these kind of creatures? Well, as it turns out, even those get a very brief mention. If you go to Isaiah chapter 30, uh, starting in verse 6, it's describing a coming judgment where people would be dragged off to a foreign land. And this is how it describes that land. It says, this is a land of trouble and anguish from whence come young and old lions, the viper and the fiery flying serpent. So here it's describing things that people know, they're aware of. Young and old lions, vipers, which are a kind of poisonous snake, and a flying, fiery serpent. What in the world is that? It's, it's a reptile. A serpent is a name for a reptile that can fly. See, mankind is aware of huge, lumbering, dinosaur-type creatures, land-dwelling ones, of ones that swam in the water that are so fierce that mankind had no chance of ever capturing it, and of flying reptiles. All of them are mentioned in the Bible just under different names. But there's an even a more common name for dinosaurs that show up all over the world, not just in God's Word. And that's the name dragon. Dragon was such a commonly acknowledged word for thousands of years that Sir Richard Owen, when he was collecting samples of these things he called dinosaurs, he would interchangeably use the word dragons for these creatures. There was a book published at the same time Richard Owen was publishing his works called The Book of Ancient Sea Dragons, looking at uh, water-dwelling dinosaur-type creatures. See, the scientific name dinosaur is like the name canine for the whole dog family, but even scientists still refer to these creatures as dogs. So these early scientists referred to them as both dinosaurs and dragons. It was very, very common. Now, as we continue in the next part of the session, we're gonna look at examples from around the world and throughout cultures of mankind's knowledge of dragons, which were actually dinosaurs created at the same time as mankind. Uh, we're sitting here looking at a scale model of one of the most popular kind of dinosaurs, the Tyrannosaurus rex. Now we're going to transition 
from man's knowledge of these creatures called dinosaurs, which we reproduce as models and put into museums such as this, uh, to where we can find actual dinosaur footprints and actually touch them and walk beside them in a certain area in the United States. Now, one of the most common places these are found is the Paluxy River, uh, about 70 miles from Dallas, Texas. It's a state park in Texas where there are dozens, if not hundreds, of dinosaur prints. In another book called The Natural Animal Kingdom, which was a book about animals that people had seen, written about 200 years after the time of Christ, the author said the Plagaean history shows that there are dragons that reach the length of 10 paces. Now, a pace is about three foot. That is an animal 30 feet in length. The largest elephants are 10 to 12, or maybe at most 15 feet in length. So here's a history book written thousands of years ago where the author has seen some animal which is calling a dragon 30 feet in length. Now, that would fit a dinosaur, but no other creature that I know of, land animal, that exists today. So that's the kind of things that are written in history books. But it's not just the writing of ancient historians that point to our knowledge of interaction with things that these ancient writers called dragons. They drew pictures and depictions of them all sorts of places and cultures all over the world. For instance, in Arches National Park, there are what are called pictographs. There, there are etchings on the wall we find uh, made by ancient people in, in caves and uh, dwelling places all over the world. So it's a picture that has been etched on the wall. And as you take a look at this, it is absolutely crystal clear what the depiction is of. It is of a seriopod kind of dinosaur, four-legged or herbivore, that these natives have seen. Now, how could they have known this if this creature had died 60 million to 100 million years ago? It seems to be something along with buffalo and antelope and other creatures that they have seen and they're depicting on their cave walls. Uh, you find similar in, inscriptions and drawings uh, at dwelling places in Canada. And here's a picture of one of those type of cave drawings. Over in Australia, we, we find a group of aborigines surrounding what looks very much like a plesiosaur that they have pulled out of the ocean or found along the shore. It actually shows its intestinal track and, and uh, the natives with spears are surrounding this very, very large dinosaurian type creature. You see example after example of various ancient people from various places around the world that are drawing creatures that they have seen that look exactly like what we would expect dinosaurs to look like. The entire evolutionary house of cards collapses if somehow these creatures have been around for 200 million years, they left all sorts of fossils, and then 60 million years ago they just quit leaving fossils, and they've never left a fossil in a rock layer for 60 million years and then somehow people knew about them. See how the whole thing just falls apart. It doesn't make any sense unless people had seen these creatures. So folks who believe in the evolutionary time frame, they just have to ignore this kind of stuff. They have to explain it away and say, well, maybe this is ancient remembrances uh, from when we were ape-like creatures and lived with these guys and the memories are coming back. Or maybe these guys dug the bones out of the ground, which are always just scattered in all sorts of bits and pieces, and somehow put them together to look like a dinosaur, uh, as if they had nothing better to do, uh, and then knew what they looked like. Uh, no evidence whatsoever that has happened. Uh, the straightforward, honest evidence is these depictions are there because they've seen them. Other places, like we can go to Peru, it's one of the driest places on earth. And when uh, these ancient cultures that lived in the range of 2,000 or more years ago died, they would dig a pit, uh, you know, six foot or so down into the ground, and they would put valuable artifacts there with them, amongst which are stones of various sizes that have been uh, engraved, uh, painted, and then etched to show various scenes of life. Now there are thousands and thousands of these burial stones that have been found. Many of them have been documented to have been pulled directly out of these tombs. And somewhere in, in, the, in the one to 5% of them, amazingly show very accurate depictions of dinosaurs. And not just one or two kind, 
we're talking dozens of very different types of dinosaurs, some of which we've never found yet in the fossil record. But we find very clear depictions of uh, things like uh, stegosauruses and tyrannosauruses and apatosauruses and so on. And you see various examples of this. Now, what makes this even more compelling as, as the evidence that these ancient people really did see these creatures is that there are features on these burial stones that could not have been known at the time the stones were found. Most of them were collected in the 50s and 60s. Uh, there is one doctor down in this area that had collected over 5,000 of these particular burial stones. Now you'll notice on some of these particular stones there are these circular impressions on the stone. Now in the 60s, no one had found dinosaur skin impressions that show these circular areas, and yet many of these burial stones show these circular patterns on the dinosaur bodies. In the 90s, we started to find skin impressions that show circular patterns in the scales. Something that showed up on the stones had never been in literature at the time the stones were found. So why would someone have carved them there based on something he had seen in a book? See, that's the excuse. Folks who don't want to accept this evidence as reality in a straightforward way, they just assume they're fakes. Because there are real burial stones showing dinosaurs, fakes have been made. Just like because there are real footprints with dinosaurs at the Paluxy River, fakes were made. Actually, the existence of a fake really testifies that an original must exist. Uh, Another evidence, uh, those of us who grew up in the uh, 60s and 70s remember the old uh, Fred Flintstone cartoons with uh, he was riding on his brontosaurus. You would always see their tails dragging on the ground. But in the 1990s, many leading paleontologists like Jack Horner and others realized that was also a misinterpretation and that these creatures, by and large, walked and traveled with their tails held quite aloft off of the ground, not dragging down low. Many of these burial stones show it that same way. With the tails held aloft, that couldn't have been known in the 60s when the stones were found, unless they had seen these creatures. Uh, all over the world we find this kind of stuff. In Angkor, Cambodia, we find a temple that clearly shows a stegosaurus carved into the stonework of the temple. Above it, there's a depiction of a monkey. Below it is probably a bird or some other animal. All animals they've seen. And right in the middle is exactly what looks like a stegosaurus. Everything else is a real animal. Why would you assume that one wasn't? Uh, the most logical conclusion is they had seen this animal also. Even in China, there, there is just account after account after account of dragons in ancient Chinese lore. You see, the dragons were very much revered. The very Chinese astronomical system is a series of animals. There's the year of the monkey, the year of the rat, various animals, all of which are real. The only one that seems to be an exception is the year of the dragon. Well, it's not an exception. This was also a real animal. It was a dinosaur that lived along with mankind. Right up into the Middle Ages, you have the, the uh, account or the legend of St. George killing a dragon. In the Carlisle Cathedral in uh, England, there is a rug placed over a brass plate right in the middle of their center aisle of their cathedral. It shows two dinosaurs they don't even look like dragons, stylistic remembrances of these creatures. They look like dinosaurs with their necks intertwined. So it's not just the Paluxy River. It's England, it's Australia, it is Canada, it's the Arches National Park, it, it's the Angkor Temple in Cambodia, all over the world, in cultures all over the world. Pictures, burial stones, cave depictions show these creatures. You have to ignore so much reality in order to hang on to the fantasy that mankind has never seen or lived with these creatures when the data is overwhelming that they were created along with mankind. One last, even more profound way of absolutely knowing the truth. If dinosaurs had been in the ground for 60 million or 65 or 70 million years, 
then there could not possibly, there could not scientifically in any way be any biological organic tissue left inside of those bones. See, we know how fast proteins and enzymes and, and um, cartilage and various parts of a human or animal body degrades. And at best, even at laboratory pristine conditions, things that are parts of our bones, parts of our bodies, they could last 10, 20, or 30,000 years under ideal conditions without totally degrading. About 10 years ago, a researcher named Dr. Mary Schweitzer out in Wyoming found a Tyrannosaurus rex bone on one of her summer digs. As it broke, uh, she later recounted that she smelled something that smelled like decaying flesh or tissue. And it surprised her because she knew it couldn't be there if it was part of the original dinosaur. But her curiosity was perked, so she got permission to dissolve away the bone with very weak acids. Inside, she found soft, stretchy tissue. She found blood vessels that had not decayed, and you could clearly identify blood cells inside of these blood vessels. Now, that caused a fiery, raging storm of controversy. And for five years, she published her paper in a major scientific reviewed peer-reviewed magazine, but she was very tentative to claim this was true dinosaur tissue. It was explained away as some sort of a bacterial film or a misinterpretation of the evidence, but she continued to study it and over the ensuing years proved that the tissue uh, was reptilian in nature, could not have been from bacteria, showed that there were remaining DNA fragments, not the whole DNA structure, but enough to show the DNA was still there and started to find tissue in other dinosaurs to the point where it is irrefutable. The only possibility, really scientifically accurate interpretation of this find, is that that tissue is still there because those bones could not possibly be millions of years old. I'm sitting here with Mark Armitage, whose specialty is microscopy to talk about some astounding finds he has made with tissue inside of dinosaurs. Uh, good afternoon, Mark. Hi, how are you, Bruce? I'm doing great. The first thing I want to ask you is uh, you have published multiple works showing that there is um, tissue inside of dinosaurs which is not completely uh, turned to rock like what people think of most dinosaur tissues. What, what's the significance of finding soft tissue inside of a dinosaur bone? Well, I think in order to understand the significance, you have to look at the history of this. Soft tissue in dinosaur bones has been in the technical literature since the 60s. Most people are not aware of that, and they're not aware of the fact that scientists have kind of uh, covered this over and kept it quiet. And so it wasn't until Mary Schweitzer came along uh, in the early 2000s and started publishing on her astounding findings that the lid was blown off this and everyone was shocked. All of the scientists were shocked because they knew that all these fossils in the fossil record were hard stone. In fact, her work has been astounding because she proved without a doubt that these are what we call endogenous or original okay. dinosaur tissues. Okay. And in fact, when Mary tried to publish her first papers, the reviewers said, you're wrong, we're not going to publish this. And she even asked one of them, what evidence are you prepared to accept? And the reviewers said, none. Wow. Wow. Can you share about your original find in a Triceratops bone and how that came about and what you found? We found this 48 inch long Triceratops wow. horn that was buried in, in the layer and we were shocked because when I brought it back to the laboratory I expected to find nothing because it, it was all exposed, all the vascular bundles, all the, the vessels were exposed to the dirt and that means all the microbes and the water and the roots and the fungal hyphae and insects and all that stuff and, and water and the freeze-thaw cycle. So I expected to find nothing. So when I opened this up and found these soft, stretchy sheets of fiber or bone, and you can see as I stretch it wow. that it comes back to its original uh, formation. And th this is bone that has not yet been impregnated with the, mi the minerals, the magnesium mm -hmm. and calcium, all the minerals sure. that actually harden the bone. And so it's predominantly collagen, with, which is a fiber, and all these little bone cells called osteocytes. 
And then I was able to dissolve the bone and find these individual osteocytes with perfect preservation. Now, at the time you made this discovery, you, as I understand it, you were in charge of the microscopy lab at the California State University in Northridge. What was the reaction from both students and from professors as you showed them these findings? Right. Well, most of the professors uh, were very amenable to my findings. They recognized it as something new and exciting. And, and that's what you're supposed to be doing yeah. in biology is reporting on new findings. The students were very excited, but there was a couple of professors in the department. In fact, one of them, after his student came to my lab and was trained and saw my work and he went back to that professor's laboratory, he came and started pounding on my outer door. So he's out there banging on the door because he didn't have access. And he came in and he said, we're not going to tolerate your religion in this department. And wow. of course, that really took me by surprise. And then uh, later on, he rose to become my supervisor. And then suddenly, after the paper was published, I was terminated. And you have to understand, when I, when I interviewed for this job, I gave full disclosure. Sure. I didn't hide anything. Yeah. My training at Institute for Creation Research, my master's degree, mm -hmm. all of my publications, both secular and, and Christian, and uh, because I had the skill set that they were looking for, they they hired me, and none of that impacted my job. Yeah. And how long after the publication of this paper were you dismissed from your job? Uh, something like a week after uh, the paper was published online, I was told I was going to be terminated. And then a week later, I received my termination letter. So it was very swift. Yeah, which seems like no coincidence to me. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. me neither. <laughs> okay. Just want to wrap up. I know you're continuing your research work. What kind of other things have, have you discovered in the ensuing years since the Triceratops form? Yes, well my function as I see it is because I have this laboratory and this equipment that God has blessed me with and the world class training, I believe that I should find as many examples of soft tissue and dinosaur bone in as many different species as possible. So we've been on two more dinosaur digs, we found soft tissue in the frill of Triceratops, which is that big plate that comes off the skull, and we found it in the condyle, which is the softball shaped uh, bone at the base of the skull. That's Triceratops. Now those are world first discoveries, which I'm attempting to get published, and it's a little difficult. Uh, but we also went out and we found soft tissue in this really exciting, rare dinosaur called Nanotyrannus. Mm. They thought for many years that this was just a juvenile T-Rex, okay. but it's not. It's a whole brand new animal. And so we're finding Finding soft tissue in nanotyrannus, very exciting. The, the cells that are coming out of this are beautiful. Okay. So would you say this is about as definitive proof as you could get that the rock layers in which these dinosaur bones were found couldn't be millions of years old? They can't be millions of years old. If dinosaur remains in the fossil record have soft tissue in them, then the layers that they're in cannot be old. They have to be young because the dinosaur tissues are young. If the layers are young, the earth is young. If the earth is young, suddenly Genesis becomes a believable book of actual history. Just so that you understand the very significant implication of this tissue not being millions of years old, you understand if that tissue is not millions of years old, which the fact that it's still soft shows, then that means those rock layers can't be millions of years old. And if those rock layers aren't millions of years old, the only option left is that they were laid down rapidly and recently by a worldwide flood, exactly the way it is described in the Bible. Now, just to show how very controversial this is and how it undermines the, the very foundational thinking of evolution, I'd like to show you an interview of Dr. Mary Schweitzer when she was first interviewed after publishing her paper showing this soft dinosaur tissue. Now, you'll notice she's very tentative as she describes what she's found, but listen to her words as she describes the significance of finding soft tissue during a filmed interview in 2005. The scientific world is still reeling from the discovery of actual Tyrannosaurus rex cells and soft tissue unearthed last week at a Montana excavation site. Thank you for having me. So, is that amazing to find this kind of soft tissue in a fossil this old? And what can the soft tissue really tell us? Um, well, it is, it is, it's very amazing. It's uh, utterly shocking, actually, because it flies in the face of everything that we understand about how tissues and cells degrade. It's 70 million years old. You don't expect to find soft tissue, do you? Not at all. No. It's, it was utterly shocking. 
So you have to sort of rewrite the book as far as fossilization goes, I, I assume. Well, that's, that's the exciting part for me. I've always been very intrigued by how, uh, how things change in going from a living being to part of the rock record. And um, like I said, a lot of our science doesn't allow for this. All of the chemistry and all of the molecular breakdown experiments that we've done. You know, well, Mary, allow Mary when I was reading about this story, I was amazed that in some of the capillaries, when you went to, to pull them, they snapped right back. Are you amazed at the quality of these remains? Absolutely. Seventy I, million years old, huh? It's, it's just doesn't seem possible. It's just, I, I can't explain it, to be honest. I Very cool. Well, Professor Mary Schweitzer, congratulations and thank you very much for stopping by. Thank you so much. Now, her words, not mine. She said, it violates everything we know about the laws of molecular breakdown and chemistry, of physics and chemistry, for that tissue to be there. But it doesn't violate any laws of science if you realize those bones aren't 60 million years old. They were buried during Noah's flood. Now the findings totally match what we know about science. But she's still blinded by her preconceptions of evolutions of fact and millions and billions of years of history. She can't even see the obvious when it's right in front of her face. Those bones aren't millions of years old. The Bible means exactly what it says. You understand God's word can be trusted when it talks about creation of very separate, different kinds of creatures alongside with man which means that it had to have included dinosaurs. And it means what it says when it talks about a world restructuring flood that would have buried these bones quite recently, not millions of years ago. And that's why that tissue is there. And it's looking at these two viewpoints of interpreting dinosaur bones, which probably more than any other subject makes it crystal clear that the Bible view, the Bible's interpretation, the Bible's clear teaching about history matches science much, much better than evolutionary fantasy in enormous periods of time that we hear about all around us. During our discussion of dinosaurs down at the Paluxy River, um, I repeated over and over again that those bones are in those rock layers because of Noah's flood about 4,500 years ago. Well, if that's true, why is it that all these cultures after the flood have these pictures and burial stones and depictions of these magnificent creatures in their culture? Well, the bones are in the ground because of Noah's flood, but remember, on day six of creation, God specifically told us he made every kind of land animal. Now, that included mankind, but dinosaurs were also, by and large, land animals. So God made dinosaurs along with Adam and Eve. Everything that was not on the ark died, and God told Noah to take two of every land-dwelling air-breathing animal on the ark with him. Now, dinosaurs lived on the land. Dinosaurs breathed air. They would have been taken on the ark. So on the ark, along with Noah, he would have taken these magnificent creatures. As Christian parents give their children, their young children, these dinosaur books that they will see in libraries and in schools and in various places at their friends' homes, you have to realize those books are systematically training your little, young, impressionable children that they can't trust God's Word. It's totally left out of everything in typical dinosaur books. They're being told those animals lived millions of years ago, which means, by implication, there's been millions of years of death and disease and bloodshed and extinctions that have nothing to do with mankind's actions. God, if he's there at all, must have just made it that way. They're being told that dinosaurs turned into birds, and yet God specifically told us he made very distinct animal groups to reproduce after their own kind. God is left out of these books because the writers leave God's out of this book. They leave it out of their thinking, so they misinterpret the data. So where did all these ancient cultures come to an understanding of dinosaurs? You see, after the ark landed, that boat sat there for seven more months while this planet revegetated. Weeds grew, plants grew, trees took root as the seeds sprouted, and new life 
started to cover this planet. And then after seven months, Noah let the animals off the ark, including dinosaurs, and mankind, many centuries later, after the Tower of Babel, started to spread out across the earth. Now, before the flood, reptiles grow as long as they live. Everything lived longer. It was a more pristine environment. I believe the magnetic field of the earth was much stronger, protecting us from more harmful rays. Genetic mistakes build up generation after generation after generation. So every generation, longevity is reduced and reduced and reduced. So things live for hundreds of years and enormous dinosaurs roam the earth. But Noah would not have taken the biggest, grandest dinosaur he could find. God selected the animal types with the right mix of genetic information on their DNA and sent them to Noah. And young, smaller dinosaurs would have been sent. And after the flood, these animals spread out, and the cultures of the world lived with them and would have remembered them. But mankind, as always, is sinful. He, he is destructive. Uh, he's wasteful. And I believe he literally hunted out of existence those creatures which were the biggest threat and the most thrilling to him, such as the dinosaurs. And throughout known human history, animal after animal has went extinct. So today we see and find very few dinosaurs. There's some hints that in deep pockets of jungles there may be pterodactyls and other type of dinosaurs still around. But by and large, none of this has been proven and it seems that they are extinct today. Now, as we wrap up this session on dinosaurs in the Bible and how that is a critical test to understand which worldview is true, the flood is key to our understanding. And, and by the way, it illustrates God's nature. You understand that God is willing that none would perish. He wants to bring all of us back into fellowship with him but God is also totally just. It is ingrained in his very character. Sin, rebellion, has to bring judgment. There has to be a payment. You can't wink your eye at the sinful nature of men like Hitler and say, oh, it's okay, he had a good heart. It doesn't matter that millions were killed in his seek for power and to place himself in God's image. You see, there must be payment for the sinfulness of mankind, and that payment is death. God spent a hundred years through Noah trying to bring mankind to repentance. But at the right time, a totally holy, totally just God brought the penalty of death upon a sinful mankind before all mankind was so far gone no one would serve him. And he brought a flood upon the entire earth, but he provided a way of safety a way of salvation for mankind. He told Noah to build an ark, a boat, big enough to hold every species of land animal, mammal, reptile, and bird and amphibian alive on the planet. And that is how big Noah's ark was. As we walk down the length of the ark, you see individual chambers um, held together by bulkheads. And the word gopher wood in the original Hebrew was not a type of wood, but a structural integrity where the wood was interlocked like our fingers or plywood such that it is so strong you can't even pull it apart once it is locked together. See, Noah was a genius. He had a hundred years to understand how to build such a structure. And mankind had been on earth for 1,500 years at this point. They were very brilliant. It had three decks more than enough room to put every species of animal needed to withstand this enormous worldwide flood. Included on these uh, animals were things like dinosaurs, mastodons, horses, and more common animals, lions, zebras. So these animals would have, many of them went into hibernation during this extremely violent event in Earth's history, but after one year went out to repopulate the Earth. But as you look at the size and the scope and the scale of this magnificent boat, and this is just a very small uh, scale model of a ship that was over 500 feet in length and 50 foot tall, this provided salvation for mankind. But you understand God has promised us he will not allow the evil and destruction of even our current world to continue indefinitely. 
at the right point, there will be a wrapping up moment of history. The mindset of today uh, is that because things have went along for millions of years in the past, they'll just go along for millions of years in the future, and there's never going to be any sort of wrapping up or judgment of God. But it has happened once, and it will happen again. But either individually in our own lives, or as all of humanity at the wrapping up time period of history, our salvation lies in only one vessel, and that is the atoning, finished, final sacrifice of God himself as he came and died on the cross 2,000 years ago as Jesus Christ in our place to pay that penalty that we deserved and to become that vessel of safety that will keep us from the judgment of a holy God, either at our own death or when God wraps up all of history here on this planet and creates a new creation someday in the future. It is coming, and just like the ark saved the world from destruction before, our faith in Jesus Christ is what will save us in the future. I hope you will take that message to heart and make him your savior in a very, very real way. So what do those who believe in enormous periods of Earth history say about these depictions of what are obviously dinosaurs found in cultures all over the world? Now, those who believe in enormous time periods uh, are definitely those who believe in evolution. They, they have to have enormous time periods. But there are also Christians who have bought into the millions and billions of years because it's been taught as a fact and, and it's locked into their brain that it must be a fact because they've heard it over and over and over again. It seems authoritative. So they assume the Bible must be wrong when it talks about a recent creation of life of different kinds. That doesn't um, affect their salvation, but it very much affects their consistency as they try to get other people to believe in God's word when they themselves aren't willing to accept it at the very beginning. But both those who believe in evolution and those who believe in creator, who assume there have been millions and billions of years, they're kind of stuck. What are they going to do? They can't believe in both because what happened to those 60 million years when, when uh, the dinosaurs were completely gone from the earth, supposedly? Well, they will almost always assume whenever something shows up in a culture that looks exactly like a dinosaur, must not be a dinosaur because they have to throw out their entire belief system otherwise. And let's look at just a couple examples. Down in Peru, and I referred to this in the main body of the lecture, there are literally hundreds of ancient burial stones that have been found in these tombs in very dry areas uh, where things are mummified and, and tomb robbers can go and they can collect these artifacts. Rocks that show dinosaurs or show dinosaurs even with mankind. Whenever such artifacts are found, they are always, 100% of the time, assumed to be a recent forgery. Now, is there evidence for that, or does the evidence actually support that these are valid, true artifacts? Well, let me describe these ancient burial stones found in the area of Ica, Peru, in another way. They found about 11,000 of these in a time period from the 1950s up into the 1970s. There was a medical doctor living in Ica, Peru at that time by the name of Javier Cabrera who liked to collect these things and people knew that he liked to collect them. Uh, so it actually created a market uh, for people to go into these tombs and start to collect these burial stones. And he collected over 5,000 of them in his own personal museum and many of them showed dinosaurs. One of the men who collected these stones at that time was a farmer by the name of Ushuya, and uh, he was caught robbing the graves, and the authorities of the day uh, basically were gonna throw him into a Peruvian prison. Now, if you understand their penal system, that is not a place you wanna end up. I mean, they are 
horrendously bad in the conditions. Matter of fact, there's a three-year life expectancy for people thrown into Peruvian prisons. So he had a choice. He could admit he had broken into graves and stole artifacts and sold them to the medical doctor, or he could claim, well, these are just fakes that I had myself have carved. And that's exactly what he did. Matter of fact, he claimed to have carved all of the fakes. Now think about this, 11,000 burial stones carved and sold, or even the 5,000 sold to the medical doctor by this one man. It, it's ridiculous to believe he could have done that. Furthermore, the stones that show the dinosaurs, they have the same patina, which is a very slow oozing out of rock minerals into the inscribed lines, as the stones that are considered to be genuine and real. The stylistic way they're carved is the same as the others. And you find multiple styles, multiple sizes, multiple surface finishes. Um, obviously, very different artists and probably time periods went into the carving of these stones. And yet, throughout the different styles and time periods, you find depictions of dinosaurs. So you have evidence from the aged look of the stones, from the carving styles of the stones, from the similarity between stones that do and don't show dinosaurs that would seem to support uh, very conclusively that these are real artifacts. And you have a very reasonable explanation why someone would have claimed to have lied about having carved them because his only other option was to end up in jail. So that's just one example. Because there are real artifacts, there are gonna be fake artifacts. Um, but just because we find a fake doesn't mean that the real one didn't exist. Uh, that's an assumption. Second example, as I also mentioned earlier, the dinosaur prints at the Palexi River universally are acknowledged to be absolutely real artifacts found in this area of Texas. But starting in the 1920s, uh, not just one, but multiple amateur archeologists and explorers uh, found what seemed to be human footprints right alongside those dinosaur prints. Now that simply wipes out 60 million years of supposed Earth history. So they were immediately labeled fakes. Now, not so much in the 1920s because there wasn't this absolutely pervasive propaganda brainwashing that, that permeated all of our culture. But subsequent to that, uh, they've more and more been labeled as fakes. And there were, without a doubt, fake human and fake dinosaur prints carved, especially during the Great Depression era in the 30s. It provided a source of income from people in this area of the country. But what seemed to be very, very sincere, very credible uh, researchers trying to get at the truth have uncovered overlying cap layers of rock and found what looked like very fresh human prints in the same layer of rock, right left strides, uh, with the inset and the heel and the, and the, and the toe compression and so on. Uh, they have also taken these prints, um, done MRI slicing, uh, to, and shown that they weren't carved because there is compression of the mud underneath of these prints. Uh, you can actually take your foot in some of them and, and put a foot right in the right and then right in the left, and, and they look very much like real prints. Uh, Films for Christ even produced a film in the late 70s, early 80s, um, called Dinosaur Prints in the Paluxy River. And um, they later withdrew it because it became so controversial. And here's one of the reasons why. Some of these very clearly defined human footprints were filmed for this movie, but within about a year, discoloration started to form around what looked like a very human-like footprint that formed a three-toed dinosaur print. So it was at that point widely accepted that these weren't human footprints, they were just some sort of a feature inside of the dinosaurian print. But here's kind of a curiosity. Where that human footprint is, or what looks like a human footprint, moves around inside of the dinosaur print, which if it was part of that dinosaur foot, you wouldn't think it would do that. The alternative explanation is, there was a dinosaur that went through that area, mud kind of filled in, uh, kind of water in that low depression, Later, a human came and literally walked inside of those dinosaur tracks, leaving his footprints. Now, that is a perfectly logical alternative explanation that seems to explain all of the data, both the human and the dinosaur prints. 
Now, I can't definitively say for sure whether any of these are real artifacts, but the fact there are so many of them that they pop up in so many cultures that the, the, the pictographs on the cave walls and the carvings in the Cambodian temple and others look so much like exactly the way we would depict a modern dinosaur uh, seems to me to make the evidence overwhelming on the side of, yes, yeah, some if not all of these really are real. But the most powerful evidence for the, the coexistence of dinosaurs and man really is this soft tissue. Now in 2015, Dr. Mary Schweitzer came out with yet another scientific paper where she had done some work where she had extracted iron from the hemoglobin cell of our blood and shown that if you can allow that iron to attach itself to other tissue, it extends the lifetime of organic uh, molecules or biological tissues by as much as an order of magnitude, 10 times or more. And she published this report and that immediately became the explanation for how this dinosaur tissue could have lasted for millions and millions of years. Now, note she didn't show how tissue could have lasted for millions of years. She just extended it an order of magnitude or so. Um, but there's something even more interesting that just shows how fast folks grab onto these excuses for hanging onto their belief system. And the millions and billions of years is simply a belief framework in which to place all the other data. Uh, this idea that iron out of our blood could preserve biological tissue showed up within one year of this paper being released in a major Hollywood release called Jurassic World. Mixed up and, 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 and uh, act as a natural preservative. DNA can survive for millennia that way. So now, even if the amber mines dry up, they'll still have bones. Shut up. As you mentioned earlier, Dr. Mary Schweitzer uh, kind of opened this whole door to soft tissue in di specifically dinosaur bones in the early 2000s. And yet, she recently published a paper. Uh, saying that it was iron coming out of blood, which is, allows the preservation of tissue, and that explains it. And it really could be millions of years old because iron's protecting it. Now, you've done some thinking and some uh, re research along those lines. What's, what's your rebuttal to that uh, proposal? Right, well, her theory is that iron and oxygen had a role. She didn't come out and say, here's the smoking gun, we found it. She said they have a role in the preservation of the tissue. Now, you have to understand that her experiment, I sort of relate to a 10th or 11th grade high school experiment because she took soft tissue uh, from chickens and ostriches and she took blood and she highly purified the blood. In other words, she used a whole set of ultra centrifuges to spin everything down and to take out, you know, blood clots very quickly. There are all these factors in the blood serum and in the cells and the tissues that cause blood to uh, clot quickly. It's a wonderful mechanism of keeping our bodies intact. Sure. And the iron is tied up in the blood Correct. cells. Correct. The iron uh, heme is uh, from the hemoglobin and it's tied up in the red blood cells. Cells. So she had to remove every single cell, white cells, platelets, subplatelets, and all the serum because it had all the clotting factors in there. She had to pull all that out and she had to use an anticoagulant. She used a, a chemical that prevented the blood from clotting after she took it out. Then she took all the cells and everything out. Then she burst open the red blood cells and again used ultracentrifuges to spin all this down. Now when I went to Hell Creek, I didn't see any ultracentrifuges. I didn't see any anticoagulant in, uh, anywhere. I just saw bones in dirt. And so the other thing she did is that she put all this in a bucket I say a bucket, a, a container on a laboratory bench in an air-conditioned laboratory for two years. It was not exposed to water or the freeze-thaw cycle or the heat of the Montana summers or the insects or the microbes or the bacteria or the plant roots. The, the horn that I found was loaded with all this stuff. Wow. And so... 
Two years on a laboratory bench does not a 68 million year explanation right. make. So, in summary, she used totally unrealistic, not related to a natural world conditions to try to justify a belief. Correct. And she had to because she painted herself in a corner, Bruce. She, she proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that this is original dinosaur protein, original dinosaur cells. She nailed the coffin shut on that. Now, all of a sudden, she's got to say, make some kind of an explanation for how this stuff is still here. Because, yeah. again, the pet we bury in the backyard, we know breaks down and die. You know, yeah, it's not there goes to nothing in, in, in years. 10 years, let alone 100,000 or a million years. Correct. Yeah. Now, Mark was fired from his job at the University of California specifically because he was showing soft dinosaur tissue that he had found to students and staff and folks at the University of California. Since then, he has continued his work. Uh, he's found other soft tissue in other dinosaurs uh, in various places in the United States. Uh, he's actually on the leading cutting edge of this type of biblical creation research. Mark is very well respected and has, has presented papers and presentations at creation conferences for many, many years. Thank you so much.